So I'm very convinced that the book of Hebrews is one of the heavyweight books in the Bible. Uh, in my opinion, it would uh, only be second to the book of Romans because it demonstrates the sufficiency of Jesus Christ alone to bring us to God. It magnifies Jesus as the one who alone can bring us into the very presence of God. He reconciles us to God. And I've been teaching you for a number of months that the book of Hebrews can be reduced to three words. Would you say them with me? No turning back. The book of Hebrews is written to challenge those who are struggling with persevering with Jesus to be faithful and true. So even though the book is challenging us and counseling us that we are not to turn back, it warns us that wandering and drifting and stumbling and walking away from Jesus are real dangers, especially when faith is under fire. So to counter this temptation in the life of the believer, God becomes the one who goes the extra mile to back his promises with many layers of force and oaths and commitment. God is determined to show you just how strong a work he has done in your life in the great gift of your salvation. So today our text focuses on the certainty of God's promises. You can take God at his word. Would you grab your Bibles and join me please in Hebrews chapter 6? And my text is going to be verse number 13 to the end of the chapter uh, from verses 13 to 20. And I'm calling this paragraph the God who goes the extra mile. Because God knows that we can be tempted to fall away or drift away or even walk away. But he wants to give every assurance that we can trust what he says to us. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 13 through 20. And it gives me great joy to remind you that the reading of God's word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you think about it. This is the word of our God. Listen to it. Verse number 13, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath promise is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, notice what he says, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And then I really love how he finishes this chapter. We have this hope, this promise from God as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of the name none of us can pronounce. <laughs> Melchizedek. We'll talk about him Next week, because the whole seventh chapter highlights the similarities between this Old Testament priest and Jesus. Uh, Hebrews 6 is God saying, I want you to believe my word and accept my promises. And he tells us what he wants. It's very simple. This will be as Baptist an outline as you've ever seen. It will be short and sweet, and the letters all begin with S. Look at this in verses 13 through 16, I think it is, verse 17. He wants you to be sure. You can tell how this whole chapter is reminding us of the confidence we can put in God and in his son Jesus. He basically is saying that you can take God at his word, you can believe his promises, and watch this, and God goes the extra mile to create layers and layers of reassurance for you so that you need to have no doubts about who he is. God wants you doggone confident. God wants you to know that you know who he is and what he has done on your behalf. 
very popular to encourage Christians to doubt who God is and question what we've always believed. And listen, I'm telling you, there's a place for doubt. There is an appropriate place for me to say, I have doubts I need to read, research, and know for myself. Jesus didn't uh, cut the disciples off in their moments of doubt. He called them to take another look at the evidence. But I'm telling you that the ultimate goal of the Christian life is to know who he is and be completely confident in this great God that we serve and love. And to reinforce the wisdom of taking God at his word, he brings up the famous illustration of God's choice of Abraham. Remember, he called Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees, and he said, I'm going to make you a mighty nation. I will bless you above all the peoples of the earth, and from you I will bless all the world. What is he saying? If you follow in the footsteps of Abraham, you start in Ur of the Chaldees, and you end at the cross where the church is born. So Jews, Muslims, and Christians, followers of Jesus, all say, Abraham is our father because he's the father of all who believe. What's the story of Abraham about? Simply God making a promise and a man believing him. Abra Romans 4 says of Abraham, Abraham believed God and God said, I account you with my righteousness for believing me. God wants you to be sure. You can't enjoy a relationship about which you doubt and wonder if it's healthy and real and strong. You need to be sure who God is. And this text tells us who he is, of course. So let me just keep uh, plowing in this furrow. This text tells us we need to be sure of him. Because he says when he was going to make a promise to Abraham, he did what everybody else does. They look around for someone to confirm the oath, and God realized there is no one greater. So he swore by himself. Why did he do that? Because he knows he is the highest, strongest, greatest being in the universe. There is no one greater than our God. There's no one stronger than he is. And we can trust him. Why then is our faith so weak? Because we are not sure of him. We are not convinced of him. We doubt him. This text tells us that he doesn't change. Malachi said that. Do you remember when the Lord speaking through Malachi says, I'm the Lord, I do not change. That's problematic for a lot of people because the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. The God who drove Adam from the garden is the God who welcomed man because of the cross. He's the same God always that he's been from eternity and will be in eternity. He does not change. I don't know what that does for you, but it gives me great hope and great confidence. My feet are standing on a rock that will never move. God, the Almighty, does not change. This text says he doesn't lie. If he says it, he'll do it. When he speaks a word, he backs it with his power. And he always fulfills what he says he will do. That's important, isn't it? Because the Bible, I don't mean to insult you. It's, it, it, it impugns me as much as it does you. But the Bible says all men are liars. Sometimes we lie with a bold-faced lie. And we're ashamed of ourselves. Often we lie to, because we're afraid someone might think less of us. We lie for different reasons, but all men are liars. So you really can't take the word of a man as ultimate hope, right, and confidence. You can take the word of God to never be anything other than what he says it is. God doesn't lie. That's why the Old Testament says God is not a man that he should lie nor the son of man that he should change his mind. If he says it, he'll do it. If he speaks it, he'll make it good. And that's why Jesus, on the eve of his crucifixion, said to his disciples, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming back to take you where I'm going. And Jesus said, if it were not so, I would have told you. I always take Jesus at his word. Because he doesn't change lie, or this text says he doesn't fail. I've told you the story, so be patient with repeating my stories. I'm not out of touch with reality. I know when I repeat my stories. But I went to Bible college without any money, literally no funds in, and, and they were kind enough and compassionate enough to allow me to stay the first few weeks. But lo and behold, the weeks went by, and I had no money, and a slip appeared 
in my mailbox saying, from the business office, we're sorry, Derek, but uh, we have to ask you to find another path in life because this can't be a free ride in Bible college. You have to pay for your meals and your tuition. And I remember standing there thinking to myself, oh my goodness, God failed me. I know he called me, and now he's failing me. You know what's happening that moment, don't you? The enemy of my soul was tempting me to doubt the character of God. By and by, before the day was over, there was $1,200 in my account from a, a private donor. And they said, you can stay a little longer. I went all three years of that Bible Institute without enough funds to start one semester. And God met every need. Because he called me, he provided for my needs. And he'll do the same for you because he cannot fail. There is no one greater. And uh, let me just press this a little bit for a moment. The reason this is so important is because there are secret doubts that linger in the minds and hearts of God's people. And as long as they do, the devil will have an advantage over you. God is working to teach you to believe his greatness, his power, and his faithfulness. God is always, always, always faithful. He doesn't fail. But this text says God wants us to be sure we should be a confident people. Not arrogant, but sure of the one who stands as Lord over our lives. And, and this text says not only are we sure of him, we're sure of his promises. And this text shows us that his promises are linked to his purpose. Not purposes, plural, but his purpose. So his promises are that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of salvation. What is the good work? The good work is highlighted in Ephesians. What is God's purpose? Watch this. Here's what Ephesians 1 says is God's purpose. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of of his glory. God's purpose is to magnify the riches of his grace through a people who didn't deserve his gift of salvation. God's purpose is to magnify his generosity in forgiving guilty sinners, and he'll do it through all eternity. That's God's purpose. For all ages of all times, we will bless and thank God for his kind heart to forgive us in the great work of his grace in our lives. That's God's purpose. And to that end, he makes a lot of promises. And he says, by the way, my, promise, uh, my promises are my oath. You know what an oath is, don't you? I don't know if they still do it in Canadian court systems or not, but it used to be. It's been a long time since I've been in court. <laughs> Aren't you glad? <clears throat> uh, but I've seen them. Please lay your hand on the Bible. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you, God? It means you won't lie, and if you do, you're going to jail. God made an oath to us. <laughs> He's forgiven us. He will guide us through this earthly journey, and then he will bring us home, and he will set us on eternal display as a reminder of his great kindness. We're sure of him, we're sure of his promises, and we're sure of... This one I think we struggle with even more. We're sure of his blessing. What did he say to Abraham? Saying, surely, it's an oath, Abraham. I promise you, I will bless you. This is the crux of the matter to me in many ways. It dawned on me at Christmas time when I was rethinking the story of the angel's appearance to Mary that one of the things that Mary struggled with was the announcement from the angel that she was highly favored by God. Mary's reaction is what every human being's reaction should be. How can this be, this great and holy God favoring me? Yes, that's the story of the gospel. God favors us with his love and grace. And he, and he does that so that he can bless you. God isn't out to burn you. God isn't out to bite you. God isn't out to hurt you. God is out to establish your life, to bless you, to save you, to heal you, to make you a new creation. God sits on high. 
watching for ways that he can reassure you that his heart is postured in blessing you. Receive these words into your heart, children of God. God is saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. I love that promise because when I was a young Christian, my heart just about exploded out of my chest the first time I heard a preacher quote Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, oh, I'm going off, wrong verse. Let me back up. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, in Christ. I couldn't believe it. I came from a poor and broken family. Birthdays and Christmas would be one gift, if that. And I hear that God wants to give me every spiritual blessing that Christ has in the heavenlies. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. But I'm sure of it, because that's what this text is promising. So, are you tracking with me, church family? Oh, it's good to be home to preach to my brothers and sisters. Number two, he wants us to be safe. He wants you to be sure of him, sure of his promises, and sure of his blessing, and he wants you to be safe. In verse number 18, if you read this text carefully, follow it with a pen, your pen will stop around those words that describe who we are as Christians. We are the ones who have fled for refuge to this great God who's made wonderful promises to us. We are the ones who know how unsafe we are because of our sin, because of our waywardness, but we have learned how to hide away in the presence of the great God of the universe. That's what he's saying in verse number. We fled for refuge. You flee for refuge? Do you know how to flee? Do you know how to run for safety? Forgive the personal illustration, but when I was a boy, I loved to play out in, uh, in the wilderness, in the, in the forest. I, was in, I grew up in an isolated uh, rural village. There may have been, I don't know, 50, maybe 50 homes, if there were even 50 homes. And I love to play out in the wild, the nature. I still love it to this day. If I can go for a good hike somewhere, I feel like I'm in heaven. I love being on beaches and mountaintops and in dense forests. I just like being out in the wild. But as, one of the reasons I do is because as a boy, when my home was unsafe, which was quite often, I would go out, especially after a heavy snow. I can still feel what it was like. After a heavy snow, there would be a heavy covering of snow over a large evergreen tree, and I would dig myself down to, to sit under the tree and look up and feel very safe. I was cocooned away. In, in this fortress of snow. And I would just lay there and think about life and the world and had some inordinate fears as a child. But those quiet moments, I was aware, even as a boy who did not yet know Jesus, that the God of the universe was watching over my life and I felt safe in his presence. We learned yesterday in our prayer seminar that God, it is God's will for you to be safe. And it is only when you feel safe that you will be able to experience the love of God. And this text says, God welcomes us to be safe in his presence. Of course, you know that we all struggle with insecurity, right? We all have personal insecurities. We all have relational insecurities. And we all have professional insecurities. We doubt ourselves, we doubt others, and we doubt that our jobs, we fear losing our jobs. We, we have insecurities about our future and our health. We have all kinds of insecurities. By the way, it's been my experience that the people who posture as the toughest human beings are usually the ones who are the deepest insecure underneath the surface. But this text is telling us that we have a deeper insecurity beyond our personal, professional, and relational insecurities, and it is a spiritual insecurity and, and uh, uh, an eternal insecurity. Because from the garden on, we were lost. We became homeless wanderers on the earth, always seeking the home that God wanted for us and had for us. And lo and behold, the safe home is his presence that Hebrews chapter 6 is talking about. We learned yesterday that Psalm 91 is the psalm of safety. 
Remember that psalm? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Teach yourself in faith to run for refuge to him when your heart is being tempted to fear and when you are struggling with doubts and anxieties. Run to him. He wants you to be sure. He wants you to be safe. And thirdly, he wants you to be strong. Watch carefully how this text unfolds. He introduces us to the great God who's made incredible promises to Abraham and to the heirs of his promise, the people of God, the people of faith. And when he makes those promises, he invites us to run to him for safety. And he says, when you run to me for safety, the result will be that you will have strong encouragement to keep a firm grip on the hope that he has set before you. Watch how this works in the text. He says, we might have strong encouragement in verse number 18. That word strong is the word mighty. I like that, mighty. We, we used to teach children to sing when I was a younger pastor. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. That's what this word means. God has given us mighty encouragement. The Christian does not need to be down and does not need to be discouraged and does not need to be defeated by life circumstance. We don't have to be. How appropriate in this month of mental health awareness that we're parking on a text that says it is your inheritance as a child of God to have mighty consolation and encouragement from the Lord. That's what the text says. The word encouragement there is the word exhortation. It means to encourage and bless another person. You understand what this is saying? God comes along not with a word of rebuke or chastisement, but he comes along to say, cheer up, my son or daughter. Be, take heart and be strong because I am with you. And the hope I have given you will see you through whatever valley He's called you to pass through. It's not a rebuke or a critical commentary. It's God saying, <laughs> it's God saying, I'm going to give you mighty consolation. You know why this is important? Uh, I learned recently that the single oft-repeated commandment in the Bible is do not fear. So it means that human beings have an unusual battle with fear for all kinds of different reasons. This passage is saying we don't need to fear. We can have mighty encouragement in the Lord to do what? He says to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. I sometimes worry that I, uh, I overwork you. But I don't want to move on from this. Because you know what he's saying? There isn't a trial in your life that can finally and completely defeat you. There is not a threat against your life that can take you out as a Christian. There isn't a circumstance that will drain and destroy you. Not one. Not one, the text says. Whatever I face, including a diagnosis of cancer from the doctor, including the inevitability of my death, I can die in peace including divorce, including the loss of my, my, my health and my wealth and my job. Whatever crisis you have passed through is not enough to exhaust the might and power of God's promise in your life. And he is the God who lifts his people up. He's the one who sees us when we are bent low. He's the one who says, I know it's breaking your heart. I know that it's wearing you out. I know that you are tired and exhausted. But he comes along and picks us up, puts us back in our right mind and gives us peace. Just yesterday, a lady told me a story that wore me out. I said to her, God has assigned a very painful life for you to live right now. She was in the first service, and I told a little bit of, I didn't give the details away, but I said, yeah, that's, that's hard to know, isn't it? But I can promise you that there is no trial or test or difficulty, including the extreme circumstances you just defined for me, 
that can overwhelm and defeat God's children because you are more than an overcomer through him who loves you so. And when a child of God determines to be the presence of Christ anywhere in this crazy, whacked out world, they get to be an example of composure and peace and clarity. They speak truth and hope and light in dark places because they have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope. The hope we have in Christ, by the way, is the source of our consolation. What is the hope? Well, I've been reconciled to God's presence. I, can, I have direct and immediate access to the presence of God, and Jesus is my high priest, and I've been redeemed by grace, and uh, I'm eternally safe, and I'm getting ahead of myself. Hope you're tracking with me, church family. I can't tell. Am I losing you already? Well, I have three minutes left, according to the clock. That sacred, blasted clock. <laughs> he wants you to be sure. Don't doubt him. He wants you to be safe. You are loved. He wants you to be strong. His spirit dwells in you. And then finally, he wants you to be steady. I've alluded to it already, but the illustration that he uses at the end of the chapter is, about, is a maritime illustration. When we were in Florida last week, we took our kids to the uh, Pirate Museum in St. Augustine. It was a blast. You walked into what was a, a, a pirate ship, and the kids had the code book that they could use to get a prize at the end. And one of the pirates came over and gave the kids little gold medallions, and I laughed. I just laughed like a child with glee seeing my grandkids having so much fun. And it was pretty cool to be walking on the Atlantic coast last, last week. And this is a, so he uses a maritime illustration. He says, you are as safe as Christ is because you are anchored, your soul is anchored to Christ. What does an anchor do? An anchor keeps a ship from being uh, carried out to sea. An anchor keeps a ship from getting lost in the storm. An anchor keeps the people in the ship safe. Christ is our anchor. <laughs> I have a good anchor. I'm not going down. I'm going to sail home because Christ is my anchor and he's your anchor. Notice what he says. Where did Christ take us? Behind the curtain. Jesus Christ took us where no man had gone before. Can you tell I'm a Star Trek fan? <laughs> Jesus Christ took us into the very presence of Almighty God. He opened the way. This means that I, right now, as I preach, right now as you sit and listening, listen to me, we are in the presence of God. We are never separated from his presence as the Jews and, old, and high priests of the Old Testament had to be. And Jesus, the anchor, is the one who took us behind the curtain. I think that's, that's pretty cool. And then he tells us how he did it. Jesus is the forerunner. That word forerunner is the, word, the, the Greek word for scout. A scout could be um, a soldier or, or a sailor. A scout was one of the soldiers that would go ahead of the troops to evaluate the danger, to get the lay of the land, to, uh, to, to maybe conduct some diplomatic business. But the scout would go before the rest of the, the troop would join him. A scout was also the small ship that would disembark from the larger ship out on the ocean to come into the safety of the harbor to introduce the captain. Christ is our scout. You know what that means? He's gone on ahead of us to open the way to give us everything that God wants us to have. When did he do that? He went to the cross, and then he went to the grave, and then he came back from the dead. And he said, because I live, you also will live. But I think there's another application. And it is that we should live our lives every day in the knowledge that Jesus is going before us and every step of the way is laid out by him and we are safe because he has determined our path. Sometimes when difficulties come, I am tempted to think that God has forgotten me. He has failed me. Somehow he's not seen what was going to happen to me. This text is saying, Jesus Christ is your forerunner. He's your scout He's always several steps ahead of you, leading you in your life. And he, of course, is 
called in this chapter the high priest forever over our faith. Let me conclude the study church family by simply saying to you, I think this is what the passage translates to in our lives. You need to build your relationship with him first and foremost. Being true to him, knowing him, loving him, and following him. The fire in your belly, the passion in your life is to know him more. As Paul said in Philippians 1, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. We want to know more of God. Don't speculate about who he is. Get in his word. Find out who God is and learn. Number two, learn, learn to take regular breaks of hiding away in the secrecy of his presence. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. Take courage. If I could, if I had the power this morning <laughs> to hook your heart up, to a power source to give you courage, I would do it. But I don't need to do it. You can have courage by trusting the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Take courage. People of God, church, get it back up on your feet and go. And then steady, steady on, steady as she goes. The, bo the boat may be rocking, but you are anchored to Jesus. You are not going under. You're not going under. Father, I pray that you would feed our hungry hearts, fuel and fire our understanding of who you are, and move us into a deeper relationship with you. May we walk in step with you. Bless your people, O oh God, and lead them in a plain path as they follow you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.